Hi, I'm Dr. Newman. Um, welcome to 184 Detective Fiction. We're going to be looking um, uh, specifically at one book, uh, Devil in a Blue Dress by Walter Mosley. But um, uh, in preparation to that, I want to give you sort of a brief introduction to de detective fiction more, uh, more generally and more specifically hard-boiled detective fiction, which is the genre in which Walter Mosley is writing. Um, and what one one of the things that we're interested in here. So uh, thanks. I thought it would be easiest just to present this to you in video format. So um, let's begin. First of all, we need to distinguish hardboiled fiction from what it, it is not. And what hardboiled detective fiction was was a kind of um, a rejection or rebellion against the kind that existed, um, which is identified often with the golden age of detective fiction. Now, detective fiction goes back to the 19th century uh, with, um, you know, uh, it was invented by Edgar Allan Poe, and one of the major practitioners, of course, was Edgar Allan, I'm sorry, Arthur Conan Doyle and his Sherlock Holmes. But in the 20th century, uh, detective fiction went kind of two different ways. Um, uh, and one was the, uh, associated with what's called the golden age of detective fiction, and this is mostly a British style. Um, it centers in 19, from approximately 1911 to 1939. It's considered the high point of this period. It usually focalizes, and you should know what that re, uh, means from your course reading, the life of the independently wealthy. It's about rich people who live in fancy houses. Um, uh, famous practitioners of this style are Agatha Christie, G.K. Chesterton, and Dorothy Sayers, among others. It in features tropes you might be familiar with. The grand country house, the concealed room, the very elaborate murder, and of course the detective who has to uh, uh, very painstakingly unravel the murder, murderer, and then you know get or assemble all the suspects in the parlor at the end. Um, the new film *Knives Out*, which I haven't seen yet but desperately want to, is in this genre of the classic country house detective mystery. It's in many ways an artificial style, as Raymond Chandler points out in the essay you are supposed to read. Um, uh, I'm going to pass over this, but there were a group of these authors were uh, collaborated together, and they um, were very uh, they, they they were kind of rules to the game. Um, and, and it's th these uh, Father Brown, the Father Brown mysteries, which maybe your grandma watches on PBS, um, is an example of these. These are adaptations of. Um, stories by G.K. Chesterton, a, ro a famous Roman Catholic um, mystery writer of the early 20th century. Um, Agatha Christie is, of course, the best known of this style. She's the best-selling writer of fiction ever. Um, and uh, her most famous detective, of course, was Hercule Poirot, a Belgian refugee from World War I. And Agatha Christie, of course, was famous for breaking the rules of detective fiction. Uh, there she is in, in when she was a grand old lady. Um, Dorothy Sayers is another wonderful writer of, of this kind of detective fiction. If you haven't read Gaudy Night, I highly recommend it. It's a very civilized form of, of writing. Um, the Ten Commandments of Detective Fiction, according to Ronald Knox, were that the criminal must be someone mentioned in the early part of the story, but not anyone whose thoughts the reader has been allowed to follow. All supernatural agencies are ruled out as a matter of course. You can't say a ghost or a werewolf or a vampire did it. No more than, and I love this, no more than one secret room or passage is allowable. Um, no hitherto undiscovered poisons may be used, nor any appliance which will need a long scientific explanation at the end. Um, no Chinaman must figure in the story. Forgive my the slightly racist term, but basically he's saying that it should not involve... Um, he's trying to distinguish it from the kind of like seedy pulp fictions of the time, uh, such as um, which often featured diabolical villains who are often uh, Chinese. Unfortunately, this is a racist trope of the early 20th century. Um, no accident must ever help the detective. They have to figure it out on their own. The detective must not himself commit the crime. The detective must not light any on any clues which are not instantly produced for the inspection of the reader. And the stupid friend of the detective, or the stupider friend, the Watson, so to speak, must not conceal any thoughts which pass through his mind. His intelligence must be slightly, but very slightly, below that of the average reader. And, and no twins are allowed. You can't, couldn't have been a twin who did it. 
The upshot of all this uh, is that there's a sense of fair play in the detective fiction, in, the, in this kind of detective fiction, that it's not so much a, a story for its own sake as it is a puzzle for the reader to figure out. Now, the hard-boiled detective story, such as Devil in a Blue Dress, is also features a detective trying to solve a crime but it has a very different character, and we're going to look at that right now. Now, hard-boiled detective fiction was not pub was often published um, in not mystery, uh, uh, um, not necessarily sort of mystery magazines or in novels like Agatha Christie wrote, or in collected stories, but in what were called pulp magazines. And of course, this is where Tarantino got the the. Um, title pulp fiction or why something is described as pulpy um, and this refers to North, uh, mag North American magazines that were printed um, in cheap um, publications that had a high circulation but low prestige this was considered a trashy form of entertainment and the paper that they were printed on was was a cheap low quality paper known as pulp paper hence pulp Fiction. If you ever wondered why that was, that's where that came from. Um, and uh, so, what was what, what was hard-boiled crime fiction? What made it different? Well, unlike the very genteel British house, the kind of Somerset, uh, summer Midsummer Murders kind of atmosphere, you had an American setting, usually urban. It used slangy, street American English. Um, it also Unlike the typical Agatha Christie novel, which only ever represented lower society as servants in the household, uh, hard -boiled, this kind of hard-boiled crime fiction gives a cross-section of classes, uh, from the very rich to the very poor. Often, cr the authorities in hard-boiled crime fiction are corrupt. You have cops on the take, you have de um, inter uh, district attorneys colluding with the mafia, you have, you know, mayors who are, who are uh, on the take. There's, there's bribery and corruption and sexual um, deviance and all kinds of um, uh, nastiness like that. It's a, it's a gr more grimmer, darker, gritty kind of world. Um, the detective is usually not some kind of pure thinking machine like a Arthur Conan Doyle or, or sorry, like a Sherlock Holmes or a Hercule Poirot, but a cynical, streetwise detective, somebody who isn't necessarily like a, like a brilliant analytical person, but knows people. Um, and it's usually what we, we in the business call an autodiegetic narrator, which is a fancy term for somebody... First person, that's basically first person, the detective tells the story about their own work. Very seldom do you get a heterodiegetic narrator, that is, as the, an assistant telling the story, such as Watson talking about Sherlock Holmes. Also, black ma uh, sorry, black ma um, hard-boiled fiction free uh, usually features crimes of impulse, not elaborate planning. So it's not... Um, uh, if you've ever seen Murder on the Orient Express, for example, there's, there's just a ridiculous degree of elaborate planning that goes on in there. Um, what more can we say about it? The Black Mask is an example of a pulp magazine of, um, that, that published all kinds of genre fiction, Western, detective, and adventure stories, um, including The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett, Dashiell Hammett, I think you read Arson Plus. I wanted to give you a flavor of the classic noir, sto uh, hard-boiled story so that you could get a sense of what Walter Mosley, writing in the 90s, is doing with this kind of thing. Um, now, the hard-boiled detective also has elements of the Western in it. This is just a famous example of major authors in this genre and their famous detectives. Uh, Raymond Chandler is perhaps the the... Up there with Dashiell Hammett is the most famous author of this kind of um, uh, fiction. Philip Marlowe is the name of his detective. And uh, Humphrey Bogart famously played... I would, I would recommend The Big Sleep as one of the uh, best novels in the genre. Dashiell Hammett is another famous um, writer of this kind, whose detective Sam Spade, um, Nick and Nora Barnacle, and the very first hard-boiled detective... 
the Continental Op, which was which is who's the detective in the story Arson Plus, which you've read. James Kane, Mickey Spillane, Ross McDonald, and Cornell Woolrich are other authors in this genre. Um, the Continental Op, which you were to read for today, uh, is the first story to feature a lot of the elements that we find in hard-boiled fiction. Um, and what he did, in some ways, was to adapt um, elements of the already popular Western genre to the detective story. We get, rather than the lone cowboy running in, riding into town to solve crimes, the private investigator, who's not an amateur, he works for a living, he does, he does this job, and of course... Um, uh, Dashiell Hammett himself, well, we'll talk about him in a second, um, but the, with the Continental Op is, is you're a classic man with no name, it's got elements of the Western, he's a master of deceit himself, and he uses morally ambiguous methods, he stalks people, hunts them down, goes through their records, intimidates, threatens, and he's kind of an anti-hero, because he's not any kind of knight in shining armor, though he eventually, usually, this kind of person does challenge the powerful and protect the weak this is they are usually a hero even if they're a dark kind of hero dashiell hammett was an interesting guy um, wrote a lot of different things he was an ambulance driver in world war one he was a, a socialist um, and blacklisted during the red scare so he couldn't write for the movies which he had done um, as in the 30s and 40s in the 50s his career was kind of uh, over and he basically drank himself to death and he had in his youth worked for the Pinkerton National Detective Agency so he he wrote a bit from experience he had tuberculosis alcoholism emphysema from heavy smoking had gone to prison this was one hard-boiled dude um, <laughs> let's see another person who's interesting is Cornell Woolrich um, who's if we had more time I would have you read his stuff too but he is the one who introduces the idea of noir, um, which is uh, French for dark or black, to hard-boiled. So rather, so in addition to all the other elements we've talked about, of you know, the tough sort of gritty fedora hat-wearing streetwise detective, um, the noir is steeped in emotional darkness, fear, desperation, etc. There's an existential dread. The universe is absurd and hostile. Um, more film noir and screen pairs were adapted from works by Woolrich than any other crime novelist. And by the way, if, if I don't know if anybody's got cable, but on Turner Movie Classics, there's a every Saturday night there's a noir uh, um, uh, film that gets showed. Uh, so let's see, let's get through the rest of this. Some other, yeah, some of our famous writers here are Cornell Woolrich, um, who I already told you about, is kind of the inventor of the noir style. Raymond Chandler, whose essay, The Simple Art of Murder, you're reading. Raymond Chandler, interestingly, was an oil speculator and, and a commodities trader until the crash in 1929 um, when, he, when the markets went dead. And he started writing just to make a living because you could actually make a living by writing at the time by writing genre stories for the pulps. Um, this is before television and Netflix and other entertainment options, and people read for entertainment. Everybody read for entertainment. It was a weird time in history. Um, here's Hammett, Dashiell Hammett, in his old age, with his playwright, screenwriter, and fellow activist Lillian Hellman, uh, also a great writer in her own right. Um, so here's some questions, just to sort of summarize what we've talked about. Who is the hard-boiled hero detective versus the classic Golden Age hero detective? Are hard-boiled and noir synonymous? Are all the differences between hard-boiled and golden age detective stories hard and fast? Does the hard-boiled story give the authentic flavor of life as it is lived, as Raymond Chandler argues in The Simple Art of Murder? Um, another question. Why do we keep coming back to the hard-boiled aesthetic? Why has it had such an afterlife? Uh, we already mentioned the movies of Qu uh, Quentin Tarantino um, have elements of the hard-boiled. Um, uh, the whole genre of an aesthetic of cyberpunk owes a lot to um, noir and hard-boiled fiction. If you've ever watched the movie Blade Runner or the new one, um, there's a lot of elements of the classic 1930s, 1920s Mars. Uh, sorry, noir. Uh, Veronica Mars, and there's been some playful adaptations of, of hard-boiled style into other settings, uh, uh, such as the um, uh, early 2000s show Veronica Mars, which is great fun because it 
it does a hard-boiled story, but in a high school set setting. And I haven't seen this movie Brick, but I understand it does a similar thing. It's supposed to be very good. I don't know. Um, and the other question I guess I would ask is, um, what can more, what can the moral assumptions, storytelling practices, and aesthetics of hard-boiled detective fiction reveal about our values and cultural assumptions? And this is one of the questions maybe we can get into discussing in the um, uh, discussion board. So I hope you've enjoyed this, and I'll ask, and please uh, come back at me with any questions or, or anything that you want to follow up on. Thank you very much, and uh, yeah, I hope we have some fun this week. Bye.